Here we gather again for the second session of the Human Eye and the Colorful World. We will begin with a quick recap of what was discussed in the previous class. We learned that a human eye is almost spherical in shape. We also learned the various parts of the human eye. In this particular diagram, we see that when we look at an object, you know the object is actually erect, right? But what's happening, what is to be carefully noted is the light rays that come from the object we are viewing fall on the convex lens which is inside our eye and the image of the object is formed on the retina, right? But do we notice any difference in the object that we are viewing and the image that is formed on the retina? I think it is quite obvious that the image when it is formed on the retina is inverted, right? It is a real and inverted image that is formed on the retina. Okay, then now the question is when we look at things, why don't they look upside down to us? If the image that is on the retina is inverted all the time, the answer is very simple. What did we learn in the previous session? From the retina, the information about the object we are viewing goes to the occipital part of the brain as electrical impulses. Right? So when the electrical impulses reach the occipital part of the brain, which contains the center for vision, what happens? This inverted image is Flipped. I'm sure all of you know the meaning of flipped because we keep doing it, you know, whenever we are looking at images on our phone or on the computer screen. This image gets flipped. So what will happen? The image after processing by the brain will appear erect. This is the reason why although initially an inverted real image is formed on the retina, we don't actually see objects upside down. Right? I hope the point is clear. We now move to the next slide. What are the similarities between a mechanical camera and the human eye? I have put them beside each other so that it will be easy for all of us to understand. Light falls on the lens of the camera. Light falls on the lens inside our eye. Right? What did I tell you? The pupil is the aperture or the pink hole which is in the camera lens which will decide how much of light is going to fall on this photographic film. Same way the iris will control the amount of light that is going to fall on my retina. Right? Along with that we have adjustments for the lens in the camera. I am sure many of you who handle you know, a manual camera, not a camera which is on your mobile, can adjust the focal length of the camera. Same way, the focal length of the eye can also be adjusted. And how is it done? It is mainly the work of the ciliary muscles we studied, which are on either side of the lens. So when the ciliary muscles expand and contract, it alters or changes the focal length of the human eye. That is how we are able to see objects which are nearby also and objects which are far away as well. Because we are able to change the focal length of our eyes. Here in a tabular form, we have tried to summarize the similarities between a camera and the human eye. How does light enter in the human eye? It is through the pupil and in the camera it is through the pinhole aperture or the opening. What controls the amount of light entering? In the human eye, I told you it is the iris which is around the pupil, right? Along with the action of ciliary muscles. And in the camera, it is a diaphragm. What interprets the image? Interprets means which is a structure where the image is formed. That is the meaning. In the camera, it is on the photographic film and in the eye, it is on the retina. How is the light, uh, sorry, how is the light focused? How do we bring, you know, all the light rays from a particular object to one point? It is using the lens, both in the camera and in the human eye. A gentle reminder that in the human eye, we have a convex lens, 
which is a converging lens. Here we go through the various parts. I think this was discussed in the previous session. This is a very you know, simple representation of where we find the different parts. I told you the cornea, the iris and the pupil. Right? Now these form the front portion of the eye. I think all this was discussed in the previous class. The next slide. Here, we talked till the optic nerve, but now there must be question in all your minds. We look at objects. Now there are two things we notice about any particular object. Number one is the brightness and number two is the color. Right? Color in various shades as we view them. Now how does our eye recognize colors and brightness from the objects? It is because of the function of two very special types of cells called the cone cells and the rod cells. Right? The cone cells are very important because they make us understand regarding the brightness of an object and the color of an object. So color recognition is the function of cone cells majorly. On the other hand, rod cells. Rod cells are the ones which are more sensitive to dim lights. Whenever the light is less, like usually early morning times or late evening times, how are we still able to see? It is because the rod cells kick into action. They can enable us to see even in dim light. A little extension of learning. Interestingly, most of the male population among human beings is color blind, which means their cone cells are not as efficient as that of women in a part of the population. That's why it has been found through research that men cannot differentiate finer shapes of color. But the same set of colors if presented to ladies they will be able to differentiate colors better. And talking about the rod cells, where do you think the rod cells are very useful? If you are thinking about nocturnal animals and birds, I can give you full marks. Because nocturnal animals and birds are majorly active during night time. And in them, the rod cells are very very efficient. Which enables them to view clearly and hunt their prey and the dim light. So I hope we have understood the functions of rod cells and cone cells. Now, we come to three important definitions before we discuss about various ailments of the eye, right? Thankfully, many of which are curable nowadays. This is a human eye again, right? And there are two important points here. One is the far point and one is the near point. Like the name suggests, it's very easy. Near point is, what is the minimum distance at which I can view an object without straining my eye? Clearly. There should be no blurring in your vision. Right? So if I am able to keep an object here and I can look at it absolutely clearly and I don't cause any strain to my eyes, this is my near point. Okay? The opposite is the far point. How far am I able to see an object clearly? Till what distance? So that is called as a far point. Why is it important to understand near point and far point? Because these two decide whether your eye is 100% healthy or not. You know there are minimum distances mentioned. As near as this you should be able to see clearly and as far as that distance you should be able to see clearly. This is what is assessed by ophthalmologist. Now an ophthalmologist is a doctor who specializes in eye and its ailments. Okay, whenever you go for a routine eye checkup also, all these are assessed by the doctor. Okay, so I hope these two points are clear. Correlated to this, we come to another term which is called as accommodation. Now in literal, very simple English, what do we understand by accommodation? Accommodation means adjustment. Right? When I say I am very accommodative, I want to say I am very adjustable. Right? Whether it is a difficult situation or an easy situation, I can adjust myself. 
and the crown, the prize for accommodation in our human body should go to the eye. Why? Because we keep looking at things at different distances all the time. One minute I am looking at the camera in front of me which is quite near to me and the other second I am looking at the tree which is outside the classroom window which is extremely far. Now within milliseconds or microseconds my eye is able to adjust its focal length. You know, I am able to see things that are nearby and within a very short span of time I can see things far away as well. This ability of the eye to change the focal length so that we are able to see objects at various distances is called as power of accommodation. So I hope all these three terms are clear because once we get this clearly into our systems, we will be able to understand the defects of vision and the corrections. Our eye is like a camera with a lens. The cornea focuses the light entering the eye. This circular structure is iris with an opening in the middle called pupil. Light passes through the pupil and refracts through the lens to form image of the object on the retina which is made of light sensitive cells. Light sensitive cells convert light energy into electrical signals and the signals are relayed to the brain through the optic nerves. The brain interprets the signals and forms the image we see.